And the lesson of Jehoshaphat stands writ large for the church of all generations. <coughs> the false ecumenism brings grief and trouble in the church during one's own lifetime. And that's bad enough. But it brings far worse problems after one dies in the generation or two that succeeds. Lessons ignored and denied by the foolish ecumenists of our day. And in all the false ecumenism of especially the last century, the church has not improved, has not gotten larger, it has gotten smaller and weaker. And in all the false ecumenism that's going on in the churches in our country, and in the British Isles, and in Europe, the churches most into it are all getting smaller and weaker. And if you merge two denominations or congregations, and this one is 100, and that one is 100, you bring them together, you've got 150. And that's the start. And then it's downhill from there on. Lessons about Jehoshaphat and false ecumenism. Secondly, what about Athaliah herself? Well, Athaliah was the offspring, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Now there's a pair. For those of you who aren't as aware, I ought to say that Ahab was Israel's most wicked king. Of all the 19, he was the lowest. And he married Jezebel, who was Israel's most wicked queen. The worst king and the worst queen. The daughter of that pair. And Jehoshaphat was so foolish that he married his son to the worst of the unbelievers. And this is the crazy thing about the false ecumenism of our day. The Protestant churches, you can see it in the Church of England and the Presbyterians, the Church of Ireland and the Methodists in our country, they're bending over backwards and getting closer to Rome when the filthiness of Rome is more obvious today than perhaps at any other time in the last 2,000 years. Even the world sees it with the abuse of small children and the cover-ups that's been going on for decades. And it's more liberal, and it's more heretical than ever. But here's the ecumenical king. He marries his son to the daughter of the worst of the kings and the worst of the queens. Jezebel is proverbial. In the book of Revelation, she's mentioned as the epitome of corruption and evil in the church through an ungodly woman. And even today, sometimes in our biblically illiterate society, you'll even hear the word Jezebel being used to describe a woman. So and so, she's a, a Jezebel. Normally though they're not referring to religious corruption but to sexual immorality, but still there's a remnant there that Jezebel's an evil woman. That was her bloodline, Athaliah. Athaliah coming from a murderous pair like that, was herself a murderess. She had a hand in the killing of her brothers-in-law. She married Jehoram, and Jehoram killed his younger brothers. <coughs> and Athaliah had a hand in that. And then Athaliah directly slaughtered all, as she thought, of her grandchildren. She slaughtered all her grandchildren. That we find hard to imagine, even given the truth of total depravity. Because God works providentially in the world. Can you imagine, and some of you here are grandmothers, killing your grandchildren, all the male ones. Could you imagine those of you who are grandchildren being murdered? by your granny. That's the sort of woman Athaliah was. And you say to yourself, Jehoshaphat, you thought, oh, she's, she's a great girl. Do no harm by her to the family. She's come right. Fool. And Athaliah's bloodlust <coughs> was in the service of ambition. Ambition for her husband, 
that his rule be secure and there be no other princes to put pressure on him, and ambition now for herself. She hadn't gotten enough out of life. It wasn't enough for her that in Israel, the northern kingdom, her mother and her father had been king and queen. And she'd been a princess. That wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for her that in Israel, the northern kingdom, two of her brothers were king, Ahaziah and Jehoram. To be the daughter of a king and a queen, to have two brothers who were king, not enough. It wasn't enough for her that in Judah, she had been a princess while Jehoshaphat reigned. That she had been a queen while Jehoram, her husband, reigned. That she had been a queen mother when Ahaziah, her son, reigned. All these relations to the throne of north and south. That wasn't enough for her. She must be queen in her own right. She must be queen in her own right, even if it takes murdering all her grandsons <coughs> and other descendants of David that were still hanging around. So that she can sit on the throne and boss everybody about and promote pagan worship in the church. Verse 10 says, But when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, what did she do? She arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. She had maybe thought about it before. And you know, if he dies, I can make a bid for power. She was a nasty piece of work. Maybe even worse than Jezebel. Although how can you compare these things? We'll know in the last day. Second Chronicles 24 verse 7 refers to her as, quote, that wicked woman. And wicked is probably too good a word for her. Lessons from Jehoshaphat about false ecumenism, and lessons <coughs> from Athaliah about the depths of depravity, which God chooses to show through false ecumenism. And then thirdly, what about Satan's hand in all of this? Athaliah wanted to wipe out the male descendants of David with the purpose that she might reign and might reign securely. But Satan's plan went far deeper. He wanted to stop the coming of the promised Messiah. The devil had his eye on biblical prophecy. The seed of the woman that had been announced to him, not just in his hearing, but to him, in Genesis 3 verse 15, who was going to crush his head. In Genesis 9, we learn that that seed of the woman is going to come not through Ham or Japheth, but through Shem. Later, Abraham is called. The covenant line runs through him and through Isaac, not Ishmael. And through Jacob, not Esau. And then in Genesis 49, Jacob says that the royal line, the Messiah, will come of the tribe of Judah. Then we have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. And then in 1 and 2 Samuel, we see the family within Judah that will bring forth and produce the king. It's the line of David. That's the key here. Second Samuel chapter 7. This promise that a king who would save and rule over the world would come from David's loins is celebrated in the leader prophets especially, particularly Isaiah. In Isaiah 7. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Of the house of David. He's announcing it to Ahaz. In chapter 9. The wonderful counsellor. The mighty God. The everlasting father. The prince of peace. Is a king of the line of David. 